thank you, all of you, for uh, coming in uh, early uh, to listen. And I thought in the context of uh, this conference in particular and extreme scaling, uh, rather than talking about a particular software framework, I would give you a, a fun talk on uh, extreme scaling, what happens when we really uh, take it to the limit. And you'll see what I mean uh, in a few slides. But let me start by just telling you where I come from, uh, the Allen Institute for AI, or AI2 as we call ourselves, is a nonprofit research institute that was founded by Paul Allen in 2014. At this point, we're over 120 researchers and engineers in Seattle, with new offices recently opened in Irvine, uh, California, and in uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, we have a, a variety of projects from uh, Aristo, which uh, aims to look at reasoning in the context of question answering, uh, Allen NLP, which is an open source uh, software framework, particularly for NLP research. If you want to have state-of-the-art models at your fingertips and the relevant abstractions, Allen NLP is for you. We have a vision project called Prior that uh, focuses on uh, vision methods, particularly uh, in an interactive context, so with a simulated robot or even a real one. They just released the Computer Vision Explorer, which is a code-free way to see the state-of-the-art performance on vision tasks. If you have an image and you wonder if a computer can caption it or uh, uh, do object detection, just go to the website and check it out. Uh, we also have a project on endowing machines with common sense called Mosaic. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We've recently uh, relaunched our incubator. We got a $10 million fund from uh, Sequoia, Kleiner, uh, Madrona Venture Group, and so we're um, launching early stage startups in Seattle. I know in the Bay Area, you know, you can just get your uh, startup funded by your Uber driver or something, so you don't necessarily need this sort of thing, but uh, pre-seed capital in Seattle is, uh, is still uh, news and exciting. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Semantic Scholar, which is a free AI-based search engine for scientific content that's reached over uh, 50 million users last year. I'm curious, how many people here have tried Semantic Scholar? Okay, a, a small set. I encourage you to try, uh, the rest of you to give it a, a, a try. The main thing about it is actually it connects the papers, which can be uh, long and boring, with, uh, with code, with video, with slides, with blog posts. So um, you don't have to read uh, all, all the papers, because realistically, how many papers can any of us read in our, uh, in our lifetime? So, so our focus really is on impact. I mentioned open source startups, uh, Xnor AI, which was about building uh, deep learning at the edge, was recently acquired by uh, Apple. We also have data sets. We run something like 20 leaderboards. We have all kinds of fun demos, uh, including uh, Grover, which is a fake news detection and generation algorithm you can uh, take out for a spin, uh, sup.ai, which lets you detect supplement drug interactions based on information available in Semantic Scholar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we publish a lot of academic papers. So here's our uh, paper graph. We've reached almost uh, 300 papers. And here are some of our uh, recent best paper awards at academic conferences from Win Grande, which just won uh, the best paper award at AAAI a few days ago, all the way down to uh, Elmo, how many people have heard of BERT, uh, the famous BERT? Well, uh, Elmo was the precursor to, to BERT, kind of led the way, and BERT uh, acknowledged it with its name and also uh, scaled it very nicely. Uh, so now everybody uses BERT, and I go around and say, remember the, the Elmo? It's like, remember the Alamo, remember Elmo? Uh, so uh, anyway, okay, and our research has ended up uh, in the uh, New York Times a number of occasions. One particularly interesting one is a notion that we call green AI, which asks the question, if we're constantly in search of the state of the art performance, uh, does that lock people out? Uh, let's say a, a talented undergrad with her laptop, can she uh, get cutting edge results anymore? And we argued that if we folk also think about efficiency as the research community and publish the price tag of our papers, we'll both um, 
figure out ways to reduce the carbon footprint of AI and make sure that it's more inclusive, that it's not just the big four or five who can uh, uh, do cutting edge results. There's a whole nother, another story there. Uh, we also like to have fun. This is a picture from our recent hackathon. And our mission is AI for, for the common good. We try to use AI to make the, the world a better place. And this is where I start running into uh, issues because there are many valid concerns about AI. How many of you, uh, when people understand you work on machine learning, AI, have, have met somebody, maybe your spouse, who says, should you really be working on that? Uh, aren't you, <laughs> right? Uh, I see, I see a, a, bunch, a bunch of hands up. Uh, so um, there really are a lot of valid concerns about AI. From AI, weapon systems, we're in the middle of an AI arms race, whether uh, we like that or not. Um, there's a lot of concerns about AI and bias, right? Uh, machine learning is taking data from the past, building predictive models in the present, and making predictions about the future. And if the data from the past contains various uh, isms, like racism, sexism, and other isms that uh, are no longer acceptable to us, probably should not have been acceptable in the first place, uh, then uh, how do we make sure our models don't uh, capture or even amplify uh, these biases into the future? Uh, there's also a tremendous impact on, on jobs, on income inequality, and uh, frankly, in this 45-minute uh, talk, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to address these. Uh, really, what, what we have, by the way, just a quick aside, is uh, AI has become almost something of a Rorschach test, where you, you show AI to people, and they'll respond with a concern that they feel most viscerally. Right? It's, it's, uh, people are uncomfortable with technology, with how things are going, and sometimes they project those concerns onto, uh, onto AI. Uh, some people have said to me, hey, why don't we just declare a moratorium on AI? Let's stop, settle down, take five, 10 years, and uh, assess the, the right way to do AI. Uh, put the proper regulations in place. And, and frankly, that's crazy. Uh, AI is global. China has declared they want to be the world leader in AI by 2030. Putin has said that the leader in AI will, will rule the world. Uh, we can't afford to stop because uh, other nations will uh, easily overtake us. Another thing that the idea of a moratorium on AI ignores is the huge potential benefits of, of AI systems. So, with Semantic Scholar and other related engines, we have the potential to create uh, AI-based uh, scientific breakthroughs, uh, both making scientists, medical researchers uh, more efficient at their jobs and potentially generating uh, novel hypotheses to deal with topics like uh, climate change, uh, finding a, uh, a coronavirus vaccine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. To do better science, we need uh, AI's help. Uh, and of course, it's not just in research. Uh, the third leading cause of death in American hospitals is physician error. Well, uh, can we use AI to help physicians make fewer mistakes? I think all of us would, would feel good about that. Uh, then there's human drivers, right? Uh, they're texting, they're drinking and driving. I don't think I need to persuade uh, you that uh, intelligent cars will save lives. The important thing to realize is even before they fully roll out autonomous vehicles, there's all kinds of safety systems already coming to market. We have 40,000 highway deaths each year, over a million accidents in this country alone, and the studies suggest that we can uh, cut those by 80% or more using these types of, uh, of safety systems. So uh, my colleague Eric Hor Horvitz from Microsoft Research likes to say it's the absence of AI technologies that is already killing people. And that's, that's the way to think about it. That's why we don't want to slow down. So despite all that, uh, AI evokes a uh, unique fear. And actually, I have a request from somebody on this stuff. Could I get a bottle of water? I forgot to, to grab one as I, as I came up. Uh, I would appreciate it. Anyway, uh, and that unique fear is a unique fear about the role of AI, our role in an AI world. Think of uh, the story of uh, Frankenstein and the golem, right? It's this fear of AI 
rising and taking over. That would be extreme scaling, right, uh, if AI uh, took over the world. And there are very smart folks like Elon Musk says, with AI, we're summoning the demon. He's literally talking about AI taking over for the human race. There have been headlines time and again uh, about um, AI is coming, and it could, be, it could wipe us out if we're not careful. And the person probably most synonymous with, with this uh, concern is Nick Bostrom uh, from Oxford. And he wrote a book about super intelligence, which is simply an intellect that is much smarter uh, than, than all of us. So um, what do we think about super intelligence? Uh, some people say, well, look, you've got to separate uh, science from science fiction. Uh, the roboticist Rod Brooks says, if you're worried about the Terminator, just keep the door closed, and uh, you see why. But the truth is, using the latest in reinforcement learning techniques, this robot will eventually figure out how to open the door, but then it'll find there's a staircase there, uh, and the robot struggled to go upstairs. Eventually, it'll go upstairs, but then there's the next challenge and the next challenge. Basically, uh, I think Andrew Ng put it really well, working to prevent AI from turning evil today is a bit like disrupting the space program to prevent overpopulation on Mars, right? It ignores both the technical challenges which are formidable as well as these, uh, these major uh, potential benefits. So I'm curious, uh, are um, uh, any of you at all concerned about uh, super intelligence? I see maybe two or three people. Reza, my job here is done. Thank you very much. I'm done. <laughs> No, so, since I'm already up here, let's just delve into it uh, a little bit more because it is uh, a perennial concern. And, and again, if you talk to people outside this room, the less you know about AI, it seems the more concerned you are. So uh, if you ask people, could super intelligence arrive in the, 20, in the next 25 years? Again, show of hands, please raise high so I can see you. How many people think that that's a distinct possibility? Okay, uh, more hands. So I gather from this that uh, the, uh, you're not that concerned about it because y you think uh, super intelligence would be a good thing. Uh, and certainly given the way we're running things on the planet, I think that's a reasonable uh, uh, assessment. Uh, we, we don't really know what super intelligence will, will be like. Uh, so I asked uh, the 200 or so AAAI fellows, the people elected as leaders in the research field, uh, when they think superintelligence will, will arrive. And if you look at this pie chart, you see that 0%, uh, nobody said it's going to arrive in the next 10 years. 7.5% uh, said it's going to arrive in the, in the next 10 to 25 years. This was in 2016, so uh, the clock is ticking. Uh, most people said, 67.5% said, in more than 25 years, meaning it's beyond the foreseeable uh, horizon. And interestingly, 25% uh, said never, never, right? They had some idea that uh, we can never achieve uh, super, super intelligence. So, it's reasonable to ask, should we even think about this at all? People here aren't concerned about it. Other people say it's 25 years uh, or more away. Why even uh, bother talking about it? Well, there are some reasons. First of all, it is a perennial concern for some very smart people, and not just Elon Musk, but Steve, the late Stephen Hawking, even Bill Gates has been identified uh, with raising concerns about it. Secondly, there's an argument that it's so, so important that we just can't afford to ignore it. So I, I had a, a mini debate with Max Tegmark, a uh, physicist from MIT who's very concerned about it. And I was talking to him about, look, we have to think about jobs. We have to think about the impact of AI on privacy. And he said to me, look, I'm talking about the fate of the universe. You're talking about what to feed the kids for dinner tonight. In other words, this thing is so important that uh, even if it's far-fetched, we can't afford to uh, ignore it. Uh, and then there's Stuart Russell, um, who, uh, who's an AI uh, practitioner. Frankly, he should uh, know better. But uh, he, he talks about hard takeoff. What if uh, at the end of this conference, right, we go away for the weekend, and we come back on Monday, Monday morning, and superintelligence has already arrived? Sure, we thought it was much further along, but we were wrong. And now we're, we're in big trouble. We're, we're unprepared for this form of extreme scaling. So uh, 
I, I spent a bunch of time thinking about this, and I realized that what we could do to address these types of concerns is move from the realm of vague speculation to uh, more empirical questions. And, I, and what, I, what I want to say about this, and this is from an article that literally, a popular article, literally appeared uh, yesterday in the MIT Technology Review. Has anybody seen this article? I'm sorry? Um, OK. Uh, I, I'm glad it's a small number so I can tell you what's in there. So basically what I argued is let's identify early warning signs. Uh, the metaphor here is canaries in the coal mines of AI, right? So let's identify capabilities that if they arrived, we'd say, okay, uh, now the super intelligence idea is a, is a real and present danger. Let's move into a more active mode uh, to plan what to do about it. Not it's arrived, it's going to be here in 15 minutes, but now we've crossed over from AI as a statistical technology that you're all familiar with to something substantially more, uh, more powerful. So, so let's think about what could be uh, canaries in the coal mine. Uh, how about the, the famous Turing test? So right, the Turing test, to remind you, right, you have a person interacting with A or with B and trying to decide which of these is a person and which is a machine. They're uh, interacting across the internet or something, so it's hard to tell. And the problem with the Turing test is in a canary is that actually it's surprisingly a test of human gullibility, right? We're all so, uh, many of us are easy to fool. And even back in 2014, somebody claimed to pass a limited version of the, of the Turing test. So, so that's not great. Uh, the second thing is if you take the real Turing test, if you do it right, you give it to expert, you allow them to extensively probe a system, for example, if somebody told me, here, check if this is a person or not. I would start by giving that system an IQ test. I would I use images. I would show it poetry. I would ask it to tell jokes. Uh, I would ask it to drive a car. Really, like, uh, take it through its paces. So then if you, you talk about the Turing test, it's not a good canary, because if you passed it, then you really have achieved uh, artificial intelligence. So that's not uh, a good canary. How about AlphaGo? A lot of people, uh, particularly in Asia, really woke up when AlphaGo beat uh, Lisa Dull in Go, because Go is such an amazingly uh, complex game. Is that a canary? Well, I, I don't think so. You know, I, the way I think about AlphaGo is I imagine uh, running into it in one of these uh, cocktail parties that are very frequent in Seattle where, you know, intelligence software and AI researchers mingle over drinks. And, and I would ask AlphaGo, uh, can you play poker? Answer is no. I would ask you, can you play tennis? Answer is, of course not. I would ask you, well, can you tell me about the game? I mean, not even the history of the game of Go, but just why did you make that move? Uh, and again, the answer is no. AlphaGo is a very, very limited system. Uh, the truth of the matter is it can't even play another game of Go until somebody uh, pushes a button. And so what we've really created, and I think it's fair to say that that's what uh, all of us are working on, both you in the audience and us, at uh, AI2, we're building these narrow AI savants, right? These systems, you train on large amounts of data, and then they achieve uh, superhuman performance, uh, but in very, very narrow domains. So these type of game players like Deep Blue, AlphaGo, uh, even AlphaZero, uh, just aren't good canaries. Um, let's, let's consider some other, other possibilities. So of course, AI success uh, is based on machine learning, the sort of stuff you do every day, right? Categories, label, data, algorithms. The thing that I want to emphasize, which is no news to you, is all this is created via manual labor. Even if you're doing um, uh, network architecture search and various other, you know, uh, meta learning, transfer learning, a lot of these cutting edge techniques, it's still the case that machine learning is 99% human work, right? Uh, who chooses the target concepts? Uh, who labels the data? Uh, who chooses the space of architectures to investigate? Who iteratively assesses the output and, and tweak things, right? This is all the job of, uh, of a human. And so to say that machines learn in, in the deep sense of the word or in the uh, meaningful sense of the word, uh, the way that humans learn is really a misnomer. It's kind of like saying the baby penguins fish. Baby penguins don't fish. The parent penguin right, goes and finds the fish, catches it, 
uh, eats it, regurgitates it, and then brings little morsels to the baby penguin. So in this, in this metaphor, the machine learning that we do uh, is very much the baby penguin. It's the last mile of learning. Uh, and so if we actually had uh, a system that could automatically form uh, learning problems, right? You come to the customer and you don't say, okay, what data do you have? What do you need to learn? The customer says to you, hey, I have a cybersecurity concern. I don't want my data to be exposed. And you'd say, okay, my machine, my machine learning system is all over that. It'll look at what's going on. It'll figure out potential holes. It'll label data. Uh, don't, don't worry about it, right? This much richer thing that's the automatic formulation of learning problems, and we are very, very far, uh, potentially decades away from that. Let's consider common sense as another uh, potential canary. So a big doomsday scenario for AI is what's called the uh, magician's apprentice, and this is from an old uh, Mickey Mouse movie where he tries to build an AI system uh, to, uh, to bring water instead of him, and uh, what happens, right, is it, it runs amok uh, and uh, too much water is brought in. And uh, Bostrom had a version of this uh, where we try to create paper clips and accidentally you know, turn the world into a, a huge paper clip factory. And again, these are very old ideas. Uh, Isaac Asimov's laws are all about how do we constrain our increasingly sophisticated uh, AI systems to prevent them from uh, causing harm. Uh, and again, there's the, the, the famous laws, but the notion of harm is never spelled out. And then if you look at his books and stories, there are often paradoxes and funny situations that arise because the computer doesn't really understand uh, what harm is. So more recently, uh, Stuart Russell at Berkeley uh, wrote a book and has penned some uh, uh, op-ed articles arguing that what we ought to do Really, the biggest problem is aligning what the machine is trying to accomplish with what we want, right? Uh, any of the programs that you're working on is optimizing some loss function. And uh, we want to make sure that the loss function that it's optimizing, or minimizing, I guess, to be precise, is aligned with the loss function that we have. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Of course, that's very tricky because we struggle uh, to articulate the exact loss function that we need. And he has a set of ideas about how to uh, bring those uh, things into alignment, bring the machine's loss function and our own loss function uh, into alignment using uh, preference learning. The, the problem with this idea is that the notion of preference learning is way oversimplified. It's a good idea, but it's super, super complicated. A, preferences come into conflict. They're not necessarily consistent. You know, I have a preference to lose weight, and I've been known to have a, a, a muffin at breakfast. Uh, how, does, how does that make sense? What are my preferences? Uh, also, this type of compatibility actually requires extensive dialogue with, with people. I don't believe that we can just look at a few examples of people's behavior and then infer uh, their preferences uh, including the fact that their preferences can be inconsistent. And if you don't believe me, think about the millions of miles that Waymo's cars have driven, and we still don't have uh, a self-driving car. These situations are just inordinately complex. But the biggest point is that preferences only make sense in the context of common sense knowledge. Let's say I've learned your preference that you don't want to be uh, killed or hurt, God forbid. Well, there are so many ways to do that. I don't know, guns, knives, carbon monoxide. Sorry to give a grim example. My, my point is that without understanding what's happening in the world, without understanding how our actions can cause harm, or a robot's action can cause harm, how can we possibly build programs that prevent harm? So our approach to, uh, to this issue is to work on building uh, systems that have common sense, as in the Mosaic project. And by the way, this is one of the holy grails of, of AI. I think if I asked you, uh, does your program have common sense? Most people would say no. In fact, uh, uh, one way to define the term is common sense is what virtually all of us have that we wouldn't argue about. So we wouldn't get into politics, but we could ask questions like, 
uh, which of these would fit in the doorway, a basketball, an elephant, or a jumbo jet plane? Or if I put my socks in the drawer, will they still be there tomorrow? Uh, another question, and this is back from a paper that Dan Weld and I wrote back in 1994, uh, thinking about implementing the first law of robotics, uh, is uh, we said, what if uh, I delete all your data? Uh, how, how will you feel? And uh, the context was, imagine that you have a softbot, a software robot, trying to manage your disk utilization on your desktop, and you tell it, hey, reduce my disk utilization by 20%, right? Uh, we don't have this today, but you can see this is going to be the next feature in, uh, in Windows, right? Uh, and so it comes back and he said, uh, I've deleted all your data. Disk utilization is down 25%. I'm doing really well. And you say, wait a minute, what, what about the backups? Say, well, that took a lot of space. I deleted those two. Right? How is the softbot, this very advanced uh, Windows feature, uh, you could call it a Clippy 2.0, how is it supposed to know that that's bad? Right? That's knowledge that's really outside of its realm. So the point is to build these more advanced uh, AI systems, we really need common sense that comes around intuitive physics, intuitive psychology, basic facts, and we really don't have that. So let me give you a classical example from the world of natural language processing where I do a lot of research. And this is an idea that goes back to um, Terry Winograd and to Hector Levesque back in 2011. Again, I'm curious, how many people have seen Winograd schemas before? Uh, a few. So, so this is kind of fun. Let's look at the sentence. The large ball crashed right through the table because it was made of steel. So the question here in the sentence is, what's the binding for it, for, for, for the pronoun it. And the beautiful thing is if we read the sentence and think about it for a second, our minds automatically and unconsciously realize that uh, the ball is crashing through the table because the ball is made of steel, right? Now what's interesting, what makes this a Winograd schema is if we take this sentence and we modify one word, we modify steel to styrofoam. Now, ball crashed right through the table because it was made of styrofoam. The table is the one made of styrofoam, so it binds the table. So Winograd schemas are pairs of sentences where you flip one word and it changes the binding of it. Okay, so it turns out that machines really, really struggle with, the, with this kind of thing because it requires understanding of tables, of balls, of the properties of steel and styrofoam and, uh, and things like that. Uh, at, in the Mosaic project, we're working on a wide variety of projects to use deep learning methods to build uh, common sense uh, of all kinds, about actions, about physical interaction, uh, social interaction, et cetera. And this best paper award that, uh, and this project is led by uh, Eugene Choi, uh, they won the best paper award for two things. One is figuring out how to automate the construction of Winograd schemas. It used to be that there were only 273 of them, and you could only get them from a guy named Ernie Davies at NYU. Super smart guy, but not a scalable uh, approach. They figured out a scalable system to do that, and also have developed the state-of-the-art model for, for solving these. However, the solution of Winograd schemas is uh, still way beyond the state of the art. So, so, so that's, that's my second example of, of a canary. I'm, I'm talking about inflection points for AI, like automatic formulation of learning problems, like approximating uh, uh, human common sense. And this is not by any means an exhaustive canary catalog. Uh, I'd love to hear from you in the question period. Where would you put uh, your canary? Uh, there's room for lots of ones. But by building this canary catalog, it puts us in a position to say to, I don't know, politicians or uh, chicken little folks or, or anybody that says, oh my gosh, we have to prepare for uh, um, super intelligence to say, you know what? We've got some canaries out there, and when they kick in, uh, we'll feel like this is more at hand. Now, there's one more argument that, uh, that I want to make here, and this is the, 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 the trickiest of them all, and this is uh, one that I really want to uh, in inoculate you against. So when I've said these things, Nick Bostrom, who's again a super smart guy, said to me the following. Okay, Oren, uh, I, I see your point. I see the various challenges that learning systems have. But what if we're wrong? 
What if there's a chance of one in a million that you're wrong? You'll admit to me that you're not 100% sure, right? It's possible that you're wrong, right? You're not that arrogant, Oren. So what if you're wrong uh, and humanity is destroyed? And it's your fault, Oren, right? Because you gave this talk. You, you told people, uh, calm down, chill, uh, somebody said. We, the implication is we have to do everything uh, to prepare. So I have to admit that when I th first heard this argument, it kind of gave me some pause. I was like, wow, maybe he's right. Uh, and of course we should have you know, five, 10 people. Bostrom has an institute, there's the Future of Life Institute. I don't think anybody would say uh, that we shouldn't have people thinking about this. And uh, it's very preliminary. So these are typically uh, philosophers and thinkers. But he said, no, no, no. I, I, I told him, hey, you can even have 10 people at your institute. He said, no, no. I think that a significant fraction of the field's resources should be set up not to do what all, you all are doing, but to prepare uh, for this contingency. And why? Even though it's very far-fetched, because if we're wrong, um, humanity will be, it'll get destroyed. So I thought about it some more, and I realized that this is really a, a version of a 17th century uh, argument called Pascal's Wager. It's really a, a theological argument. So let me uh, share with you this, uh, this argument. So basically, Pascal uh, was a famous scientist, but also a religious man. And he tried to construct a rational argument for the existence of God, uh, the Christian God in his mind. And the way he did it is he did a two by two table. So we have God exists and God doesn't exist. And we have you believe in God and you don't believe in God. So let's go through uh, the four cells. If God exists and you believe in God, uh, hey, that's, that's great, right? You'll have eternal happiness, life is good. Uh, if you believe in God and God doesn't exist, Nothing so bad happens, okay? Maybe you've given up, I don't know, something for Lent, or you know, if you're Jewish, maybe you um, uh, eat kosher food. This, you accept some restrictions on your life. Many of them, like thou shalt not kill, are good restrictions, and other ones uh, have a very small cost compared to what happens in the bad case. God exists, and you don't believe in God, now you're subject to everlasting hell, eternal damnation, right? This is really bad, so you better, uh, um, act as if you believe in God. You better be a religious Christian uh, just to avoid this cell. And of course, in the fourth cell, uh, you don't believe in God. God doesn't exist. Uh, n nothing much happens. But this uh, table, if you do the, the math and the expected value, shows, uh, according to him, that the only rational thing to do, even if the chance is one in a million, even if the chance is one in a billion, is to believe in God. And the funny thing here is if you think about super intelligence, this omniscient and omnipotent uh, AI system, right, that can easily take over the world, the people who described it have kind of resurrected God, right? What, what is God if not an omniscient, omnipotent uh, system? And now they're telling us you better believe in it uh, because what if it exists or what if it could exist tomorrow? So the problem with this argument is that it tries to do a rational analysis based on infinite disutility. And that messes up the, uh, the matrix because I can use infinite disutility to argue for exactly the opposite. So let's suppose that there's a God that wants you to be an absolute and total atheist. But if you exhibit any religious sign, right? You go to church even one time, you will be suffering from an everlasting hell. Right? So clearly, by the very same argument, you have to be a very strict atheist, a fundamentalist atheist, show no religious uh, ideas of any kind. Obviously, this is absurd. It's what's called a reductio argument. Right? We can use similar premises to derive opposite uh, conclusions. And so this is not an argument uh, that makes sense. So uh, to end, here's my, uh, I call it doctorationes. Uh, prescription for AI and for scaling AI. Number one, identify and monitor AI canaries. Love to hear your favorite ones. Two, uh, on all these real world uh, AI challenges that I, I didn't have a chance to talk about, I think that we do need to be uh, discussing those. We need to be building technology that's less biased. We need to think about regulation, at least when it comes to AI applications. I think that the whole Superintelligence uh, concept is a distraction 
uh, from, from, from these issues. We have some uh, very real issues to think about as a community. And last but not least, and these seem like uh, good words with which to uh, uh, open this conference, uh, we obviously want to continue and build to build and scale uh, AI systems, uh, hopefully for the common good. Thank you very much. And I think I have a few minutes for questions I tried to say. Exactly. Time. So uh, there are two mics on, actually one mic here, and uh, one mic way over on the other aisle. So please walk up to those mics if you have a question uh, for Oren. Give a little time for people to walk there. In the absence of a mic in the middle aisle, <laughs> you were looking for canaries. Here's my suggestion. When there is any indication that a AI system has enabled itself to acquire and continue to increase the resources on which it is running, and the model that I'm using for that is the computer called Mike in Robert Heinlein's early story, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Once the machines can acquire resources and do that without human intervention, that ought to be a signal for inspection, if not alarm. Um, th thank you for that. So d just to repeat it quickly, if uh, not everybody heard, uh, if we have a machine that is constantly uh, accumulating more resources without human intervention, that's a sign, right, that, uh, that something is, uh, is heading in a potentially dangerous direction. I think that's a great intuition. I love that. W we just need to qualify it a little bit because if you just hook some of these uh, you know, multi-billion, trillion parameter models, uh, and you keep training them, right? They seem to be uh, taking more and more uh, um, energy. But I think that, that you're right. Uh, our, our typical mechanisms, right, take energy to a point and then asymptote, if because it's, it's one-shot learning, right? It'll train, optimize on the data set. It won't keep growing. So if it's starting to um, take over more and more resources, uh, that's very, uh, very much a canary. So thank you for that. Um. Yes, yes. Yes, the, these things uh, need refinement. I, I was just addressing the, uh, the intuition, which is uh, an important one. Hello. Um, so you, the example of the penguin, I think, is a little extreme because, uh, yes, I agree that we do a lot of work for the machine learning systems to work, but also uh, in 2020, in most ML problems, we have reached a level of which cannot be very easily bettered. I'm just trying to say that um, we, um, it, it's fairly hard to make substantial improvement in a lot of problems that we work on using machine learning today. How does AI2 think about where to focus on? How are you guys deciding you know, for the next two to five years which areas to, uh, um, to explore, where to give more energy? If you could speak to that. Sure. So, so let me address the, the first point, is, is the penguin example uh, extreme. You know, the, the easy thing to say is, of course, it's a, it's a metaphor, a, a bit of hyperbole. But, I, but what I really want to underscore is that there are two notions of AI, and they do get conflated. Maybe not by you, but certainly uh, when people talk about it in the popular press or, or, or non-experts. One is a set of technologies, right, that you'll hear more and more about in the rest of this conference that take in large amounts of data and build uh, increasingly uh, more powerful models to make distinctions. And that 
is very powerful, very sophisticated, and we've learned that applies across a tremendous range of industries, from computer vision to speech processing to credit card fraud. I did work on identifying airfare fluctuations, uh, you, you, you name it. And that's going to continue. The question is, at what point does that lead off to something entirely different, which is much more sophisticated, something that can get its own uh, energy resources, something that can have common sense, something that can serve as a doctor, not classify radiological images, but actually act as a doctor. And in that broader context, I, I think that uh, machine learning is very much the baby penguin. As for AI too, uh, we, we focus on natural language processing and computer vision. And because industry is moving so fast, uh, we usually look at scenarios that are way beyond uh, what, what you can do uh, today. So for example, okay, you can do object detection very well. How do you do scene understanding? You can do scene understanding. Can you translate that to navigating your way in an environment? Can you navigate your way in an environment with multiple agents? Uh, we have a simulation where you have two agents trying to move a couch. Uh, if you've ever tried to move a couch with somebody, you know how hard that is even, uh, even for humans. Uh, in, in, in the case of natural language processing, uh, another big thing we're, we're doing is moving from uh, NLP over sentences, most of NLP has been at the sentence level, to NLP over full documents. So for example, in Semantic Scholar, we get scientific papers as input and we need to work on those. And then last and not least, and this is something a lot of people work on, uh, often in NLP, there's some very simple and easy ways to get labeled data, either using self-supervised methods or from uh, Mechanical Turk. In the case of science, if we want to label data, often you need an expert or at least a sophisticated undergrad to label data. So we're looking at uh, deep learning methods that require uh, less and less labeled data. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'd like to go back to the um, Pascal's wager that you showed, because uh, in my opinion, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, pushed onto the uh, argument there. Um, if you replace God with superintelligence, I think it needs a bit more clarification what the argument really is there, because the superintelligence is not like it is or it isn't. It's like, is it possible in the foreseeable future, like within 10, 25, or whatever years. So I think a little bit more detail needs to be uh, inspected there. And also, like I would argue that the weights in the matrix are not uh, entirely accurate, because if, for example, God does not exist and you believe in God, it's not true. It Maybe nothing happens at the level of the individual, but as a society, that has huge implications. And I'm arguing that it may be true as well for superintelligence if you replace that, like, will it happen within the next X years? Uh, thanks for the question. Let, let me uh, see if I can clarify this. To your second point, first of all, you're right. Nothing happens is an oversimplification. The, the point there is that in that cell where it says not, nothing happens, there's a small finite cost. It's just that that small cost or that small benefit uh, is dwarfed by you know, uh, er everlasting hell or uh, eternal happiness. That's the first point. The second point, the reason that I bring up Pascal's wager is not to talk about the notion of superintelligence generally, but to talk about this attempt to shortcut our thinking by saying you have to think about this radically implausible idea. Uh, superintelligence is around the corner, or superintelligence is coming in 10 years, whatever version of it there is, because of the infinite disutility. So it's an attempt, it's actually a very clever attempt to hijack your thinking and to say, even though you s think something is highly implausible and so you shouldn't worry about it, it's so, so uh, dangerous that you have to listen to me and you have to do what I say. And one way to show that that argument is flawed is, is, is to make this analogy. Basically, what I'm saying is, if you identify something as having infinite disutility, and certainly destroying the human race, ending humanity as, as we know it, if you read uh, Bostrom's writing or, or Elon Musk's tweets, uh, uh, that's what we're talking about. 
Uh, I'm just pointing out that this is an attempt to hijack rational thinking through the use of infinite disutility. So you can ignore all the theological aspects of it. That's just historical. The bottom line is anybody who's telling you that they will tell you what to do based on a notion of infinite disutility is trying to trick you. Um, let's go back. Hi, Oren. My name is Pooja, and I'm on your side on the topic of superintelligence. I think we have a lot of other problems to solve before we get there. However, I think one of those problems is bias in machine learning, and I'm curious what is your take on a possible solution for bias in machine learning when machine learning models are inherently biased? Thank, thank you for that question. Again, uh, I, I, should, I should highlight and um, Maybe uh, next time uh, I'll, give, I'll give a longer talk because I do have a lot of thoughts about the real problem. The first thing I want to say is I'm emphasizing, let's put away the unreal problems exactly so we can deal with, uh, with the real ones. So first of all, on the question of bias, uh, clearly, it's a very real problem. It's been documented in language. It's been documented in images. It's been documented in applications. And I think that there are, uh, but the good news is, unlike some of these problems, I do think that we can find our way towards solutions. So what are some of the solutions that people have talked about? Obviously, creating a more diverse set of people around the table in designing and evaluating these systems is essential, and I think the community is aware of that. Secondly, understanding uh, the properties of the data set. Right? Uh, what is the bias that's inherent in the data set? And third, from a technical point of view, uh, more and more research is emerging that is able to constrain the behavior of the learning algorithm. For example, to identify an invariant that says, uh, I'll not amplify the bias um, in, in the machine learning data. That's not a complete solution, but at least I'm not making it worse than the data. Other ones, there was a recent paper about bias resilient networks. We could say uh, we're gonna guarantee that the data doesn't consider certain variables or even variables that are correlated with them to a certain degree. So there are more and more uh, technical or semi-technical solutions to this problem, or I should say approaches rather than solutions, and they need to go hand in hand uh, with, with the human element. The last point I wanna make here, which is a really important point is, Often when we think about AI systems, we're in a little bit of a trap, right? We identify, and there's some uh, jarring examples of AI being biased, of AI you know, um, uh, having egregious performance, but we forget to reflect on how does this compare to what came before? Right, so the original sin of bias is people. People are incredibly biased, and AI systems have something to offer, because what people do is they're biased, and then you ask them about it, and they lie about it, right? And our AI systems at least won't lie when they tell you what variables they've considered and so on. So I think really the ultimate solution here when we think about fairness is a joint system, augmented AI, where you have people and machines working together to produce less biased outcomes. I see Reza looking at his uh, watch. So maybe one last question. La last question, okay, so I'll, that person disappeared. So on the topic of the computers and uh, humans working together, one of the limitations that you had for the AlphaGo was that it cannot explain what it's doing to the humans, but once the robots take over, why does it matter? It would be sufficient for a robot to explain what it's doing to another robot and the human mind doesn't really come into picture. So you're saying, why, why, why do we need explainability given, I think you were assuming, yeah. Explainability to humans specifically. If the robots operated some different set of assumptions and history, then maybe they don't need to bother telling us what they are doing. Right, so uh, I think that's a reasonable point of view. I think most of us feel more comfortable with high stakes decisions that we get an explanation, whether it's the recommendation to fire a rocket, where it's really a, a, a very strong ethical issue, right? We want a human in the loop before a rocket is fired. Or uh, even in a medical uh, context, it was just a couple of days ago, one of these little Twitter debates where uh, Jeffrey Hinton said, hey, do you want a 90% uh, you know, correct system 
of diagnosis that's a black box, or do you want an 80% system that's able to explain itself? And to me, that's a bit of a false dichotomy. If the doctor says, hey, Oren, we need to remove your kidney. We're wheeling you into surgery now. And I say, why? I say, well, the statistics show that that's the best thing for you. I still feel pretty uncomfortable, because we know also these AI methods are brittle. I say, no, no, I would really like an explanation before you put me under. Fact of life. Thank you very much.